<clears throat> Call to order the meeting of the Haverford Township Zoning Hearing Board of Thursday, February 6th, 2020. Present at the front table, to my far right is Ken Richardson, a voting member. Good evening. My right, Bill Rhodes, a voting member. My far left, Jessica Vitale, a voting member. Good evening. Next to Jess is Ed McGargy, a voting member. To my immediate left, Bill Malone, our esteemed solicitor. My name's Robert Kane, and uh, we have three decisions tonight and two new cases. Before we begin, Kenny, would you please lead us to the pledge? Yeah, please rise. Yes, Mr. Chairman, we have minutes from the two meetings we had, January 14, 2020 and January 16, 2020, and uh, they were submitted with, and I I'd like to move that they be approved as distributed. Second. Okay. And what, what were those dates again? January 14, 2020, January 16, 2020. So, Ed, would you mind doing that as two separate motions? So, okay. move, move the January 14 month first. Okay. First, I'd like to do make a motion to approve the January 14th, 2020 minutes as distributed. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Let's we'll follow that up with a motion to approve the January 16th, 2020 minutes as distributed. I'll second that. And I need to abstain <clears throat> because I wasn't present that night. Uh -huh. And that's why I asked for separate motions. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So those minutes are moved. Four with one abstention. <clears throat> the first decision this evening is case Z19-29, Janice Rolnick and William Sines, owner of 831-835 Penn Street, Bryn Mawr, PA, DC folio number 2205-0081400, who appealed the determination of the zoning officer that the existing lot improved with a single-family semi-detached dwelling and non-conforming commercial garage cannot be subdivided as a matter of right under code section 182713B and section 182802 to allow for the construction of a single-family dwelling on the newly created lot. Property is on R6 and located in Fifth Ward. Bill, would you please take that decision? Uh, yes, for applicant uh, application Z19-29, I would vote to deny the appeal of the determination of the zoning officer and the requested relief. Any other motion? All right. Kenny, how do you vote? I vote no. Yes? I vote no. Ed? I concur. And so do I. Application is denied, 5-0. Next decision is case Z19-32. Eric and Amy Gorman, owners of 1000 Carroll Road, Wynwood, PA, DC folio number 2208-0015600, who request a variance from section 182727C4 to erect a four-foot-high split rail fence in primary front yard of a corner property. Property is on R4 and located in the 8th Ward. Kenny, would you please take that decision? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, due to the unique configuration of the lot, I would vote to approve with the following condition, that the fence will not protrude past the front of the house as it faces Carroll Road, that it be completed with within one year and according to the notes of testimony. Bill? I agree. Jess? I agree. Ed? I agree. And so do I. That application is approved, 5-0. Next decision is case Z19-33, Philip and Laurel Drucker, owners of 509 Fairmont Road, Havertown, PA, DC folio number 2201-0040200 request a variance from section 182206 to, in, to construct an enclosed porch, thereby encroaching into the side yard setback by three feet. 
The property is on R4 and located in the first board. Ed, would you please take that decision? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I vote to approve the requested variance with the following conditions. First, the, the enclosure will have electric only for utilities. Two, stormwater will not impact neighboring properties. Three, the addition will be installed per the notes of testimony. Four, the nearest point from the property line will be no closer than five feet. The front corner of the property will be no closer than seven feet from the side yard property line. Front corner of the addition? From the corner of the addition, uh, correct, the sun porch. And five, to be completed within one year of approval. Eddie? I concur. Bill? I concur. Jess? I vote to deny the application. I vote yes. That application is approved. Four. Our first new case is Z20-1, Sleepy Valley Holdings, LLC, owners of 61 Harvard Road, DC folio number 220700-6270, to seek a special exception to allow development of a vacant lot with a net area of 5,750 square feet, less than is allowed under section 182.261. Property is on R4 and located in the seventh ward. Hello everybody, my name is uh, Vince Spazzato. I'm the owner of the lot of the parcel. Um, the name of my company is Sleepy Valley Holdings, LLC. What, what's your name again? Vince Spazzato, S-P-O-S-A-T-O. You know how this works, Vince. Yes, I need sir. to swear you. Please raise your right hand. Sure. You swear to tell the truth, all the truth, and nothing but the truth, so have you got? I do. And your full name again, for the record, and the capacity in which you appear? My name is Vincent Spazzato. Uh, I am the principal of Sleepy Valley Holdings, LLC, and I'm uh, appearing capacity as the, uh, the owner of the uh, parcel. Okay. Please tell us a little bit about what you would like to do and why. And I'm sure if you have any exhibits, you likely already marked them. Please. Sure. Sure. Um, basically, I am uh, I'm the owner of the, of the parcel. I'm here with uh, Chris Yan, who is uh, the engineer for the project. Um, we are looking to build a single family home on a uh, already existing lot. Um, we do need one special exception. And what I'd like to do right now is introduce Chris, just so you can kind of get his background and uh, expertise in the, in the field. So okay. uh, Chris, Jan, I'd like to ask you a couple questions if you could. Vince, before you move on, do you have any exceptions? You have oh, I'm sorry, yeah, but... this, is our, this is our plot plan here. Um, and I was, I was gonna kind of let Chris uh, take over and he could present the lot as it appears, if that's okay. So why don't you mark the, the plot plan there as exhibit A. Arlene will actually mark your version. Arlene will tell you. This is a copy of that. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. And your full name and the capacity in which you appear this evening, please. Christopher C. Yon, Y O H A. Engineer and the professional engineer that worked on the project. Okay. Go ahead, Vince. Okay. Uh, Chris, I'm going to ask you a few questions if you can answer them for the board and the audience. Uh, just identify yourself once again and indic indicate your background in education. We are a professional engineer. I uh, graduated from Columbia University with a nominee in social Okay. Chris. You picked up by the recording. Chris, are you a licensed engineer in Pennsylvania? Yes, I am. Okay. Have you testified in front of this board before? 
front of this board. Uh, okay. And I think you provided your resume uh, to the board? Yes. Okay. You want to make that an exhibit or is it? Okay. We'll mark that as exhibit A2. Sure. Mr. Yan, uh, can you tell me? Thank you, Arlene. Mr. Allen, can you tell me since, uh, well, when you were here before the board in the summer of 2019, were you admitted as an expert? Since that time, has there been any suspension, censure, or any other uh, negative activity with regard to your licensure in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? Are you licensed in any other uh, state or Commonwealth? Go ahead. All right. A anybody want to see us? CB, if there's, and, and what area, just general engineering is the area of expertise that you offer them up for? Is that correct, Vince? Yes. Unless there's an objection from one of the board members, we'll admit Chris as a, an expert in that general civil engineering. Go ahead. Okay. Chris, did you prepare, did you prepare this site plan? Yes, I did. Okay. And can you describe what this plan shows? So this plan shows the property in, in the center of, of the plan. Uh, on the top of the plan is Harvard Road, which runs left to right, also uh, east to west. Um, a little bit, this is kind of a block with all lots that are the same size, that 5,750 uh, 5, square feet, at least according to the uh, Delaware County parcel information. So there's Harvard Road to the top. Uh, if you want to see to the left, is Manor Road. Uh, below this is the old. Okay. Um, can you just tell them why we are here for a special exception request? Sure. So this property is in the R4 district, which requires 6,000 square feet per lot. Uh, it's an existing lot, but it's only 5,750 square feet. And so we need to request a special exception to build on the lot. Okay. Is the plan otherwise compliant with uh, zoning? Yes, we have a, a zoning chart up here underneath the location map, and we're compliant with the uh, all the setbacks, the building coverage, impervious coverage, uh, and, and the building height. So the only reason we're here is for the, the special exception to build on the lot that is less than the minimum. Okay. And um, is this request consistent with the other properties in the neighborhood? Yes, I checked at least uh, a few properties on both sides of this, and they were all the same, same lot area. I thought we did. Basically building a, a house that has a... Okay. Okay. And does the special exemption ex exception request comply with the standards set forth in the code? Yes. Do you want me to run through those or I've read through them and I believe this comes with the I don't want to tell you how to present your case, but I don't think you need to read the, the zoning code to us. Okay. Um, any, I would like to welcome any questions from the board or any questions from the audience. Bill? I had one question. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, on A1, um, the tan-shaded area that shows um, essentially a house that um, it, uh, looks like it, it, it's, sure. it's building, you're building to the full envelope except for um, a few feet in the back. Is that, this house is depicted as absorbing the entire building envelope except for um, some feet in the back. Is that right? Could you give us an idea of? Confirm that. There, I, I didn't see a distance from the depicted house to the edge of the rear envelope, building envelope. Okay. That, that's correct. Uh, oh. It required a 30 foot front yard and two 10 foot side yards, and that is what we're providing Sorry, you here. Required a 30, foot uh, 30 foot front yard, and the side yards are 10 feet each, and that's what's provided. Uh, the rear yard is required 25 feet, and we're providing 30. 
Okay, so you're, the, the house is depicted as absorbing the entire building footprint except for five yards along the rear, or five, five feet, I'm sorry. Right. Um, and um, in the uh, west side of the building, the building is depicted as having a 10, 10 foot setback, or side yard setback, but um, there shows a cantilevered fireplace that uh, seems to be in the side yard setback. I believe that's the permitted projection. Okay. You know, Margie? Mm -hmm. If my memory serves me correct, it, it, I think it's up to two feet, I believe, but the I'm fireplace. not sure exactly. What, yeah, the fire, the cantilever of the fireplace, yes. And that's, that's correct. Okay. And so the distance from the outer edge of the exterior of the fireplace to the side yard boundary is, in fact, eight feet. I don't have that dimensioned on the plan, but I have a scale here and it's scaled to these two feet. And if that's the uh, two feet is the maximum we can apply, but that would be uh, I don't have any other questions. No. <clears throat> so, in, in all other respects, <coughs> other than the building area, uh, this complies with the zoning codes? The lot area, correct. The lot area. Ed? Yes, um, I heard you testify that um, the two adjoining lots are similar in size. They're not 6,000 square feet. Uh, according to the Delaware County parcel data, which I looked at today, I looked at seven Harvard, 53 Harvard. One is 35. There's two on either side, and they're all listed as 50 by 150. Okay. Um, the adjoining lot and Schuster, other land. So she is the one that possessed two lots, the both lots. He, these, she was yes, yeah, she was the original owner of, of the home and the lot, um, and sold them both. Okay. The two squares that you have represented on there, are, are that house size or is that just the representative where? Those are the existing but they're I don't think it's representative of the actual size. That's what I'm trying to get at. When you yes. drew the plans up, that's not what you, okay. Um, and the, do you know whether a Miss, uh, <coughs> Miss Schuster had um, ever received tax bills that combine these two lots or were they two separate tax bills that were received? They were always separate tax bills. Do you know what year these this lots were subdivided? As far we do have we do have it in the deeds. I know for a considerable time it was always a separate deeded parcel and lot. Um, we could probably provide that if we looked in the deed. We could probably okay. provide you the year. Then the subdivision that occurred occurred prior to uh, the uh, Ordinance that required 6,000 square feet? I believe so, yes. I have a copy of right. the deed prior to when. See if you valid. There's uh, all the certain, a lot of piece of ground, blah, blah, blah. According to a certain plan of lots called West Brookline. I'm sorry, so according to a certain plan. I'm sorry. Uh, a certain plan that's called West Brookline, surveyed for the Marion Title and Trust Company of Ardmore by Milton Yerkes of Brynmar on May 10th, 1970. According to the deed. Okay. Um, the lot that you that's proposed for the construction of the new single family detached dwelling, uh, are there any improvements on the lot? Currently, like a driveway or garage or anything? No. So it's a totally vacant lot. It is. The adjoining property has a, a, its own driveway for two. Um, the Mrs. Schuster's property, <coughs> or formerly Mrs. Schuster's property, has its own driveway. I'm not. Yes. yes. The other one does. Yes, the other one does as well. That's all I have. That's Scott. No further questions. Any? Nothing further. Do you have any other questions? No. Anything else you want to add, Vince? No. 
Sure, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. The I'm going to call the neighbor. Okay. okay. <laughs> and you guys may step back. Okay. With that, I'll ask if there's anyone present that receives certified mail that wishes to testify. If you're next door, you must receive certified mail. Actually, my name is Toby. I did not. Oh, I should have. Yes, you should have. <laughs> but, and just don't let me forget to get my I won't get exhibit back, back, I'll get back before now. you leave. Okay. I know what it looks like. <laughs> Please um, raise your right hand. I have to swear okay. you. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. And your full name and address for the record, please. Barbara Racino, 65 Harvard Road. I'm sorry, can you say last name? R-O-S-S-I-N-O. 65 Harvard Road. And what would you like to tell us tonight, Barbara? Well, I'm, my concern with the new property and, out of, and looking at this, like you said, it's not in scale, but I wanted to see how big it was and worried, obviously, about the water issue because it's the house next door to me. And I wanted to make sure that the drainage and the water and everything, the engineer is going to say that it's not going to come my way. Because okay. it's just, you know, we've had a lot of flooding. Like even tonight, there'll be some wet water. I have a sub pump and I don't want any more water. That's my concern. Obviously, I don't want it super close to my house either, but whatever is within boundaries, I'm fine with. Yeah, the building envelope is within the, that, all the yeah, setbacks. Yeah, that makes sense. But that's my true concern is the water runoff and the water in the township and the water on our street because it, it floods down at the end of our street too With all when, when we have big rainstorms. It comes all the way up to my house. I mean, I have a driveway, so it's not my – but it's like in the street too, so it's a concern. We'll ask more questions about that. Okay. Is there anything else? Yeah, that, no, that's, I, I'm just here to hear what's happening and you know, be informed and know Good. what's happening next door to my house. Happy to have you. Okay. Good. Is there anyone else that received certification? Yeah, oh, do you have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Zeno, can I? Um, so the applicant's asking for a special exception. And so the zoning code requires us to consider certain sort of factual uh, things. But uh, we look sometimes to the neighbors for feedback on this. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to kind of ask you a couple questions just so we can check it off. Okay. Um, do you think, do you have reason to believe that this type of development wouldn't be suitable for this property? I can't see the scale. I would love to see the scale of my little Cape Cod next to what they're building. Right. You know what I mean? I don't know how big it is. The end of our street has gigantic, normal, like big McMansions that would not fit next to my Cape Cod and next to me, 69, two Cape Cods. I don't know what that's gonna be. Um, do you think this would detract from your neighborhood? It's an old-fashioned looking neighborhood. Like I said, if it fits, we have it's kind of like a little bit of everything, but if it fit, I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't mind a house being there. I'd like to see more of what it's going to look like. Yeah. Okay, that's all I had. Okay. Anybody else? Kenny? No. Jess? No. Ed? No. Okay. okay, thank you. Is there anyone else that received certified mail? Anyone that received regular mail? Any other residents of Hereford Township? Okay. Chris, you want to come back up? Yeah. <clears throat> so you heard Barbara's concern. I did. Water run. Uh, what, what sort of water mitigation plans do you have in mind for the project? Well, so we have to submit for a grading permit. We didn't do that yet. This is kind of the first uh, step to make sure we get this approval before going through that effort. Uh, that being said, we did get a boundary and topographic survey, uh, and it has one-foot contours, and I didn't bring a copy of that with me. However, uh, the contour line at the southeastern corner of the lot is 460, and it drains towards uh, Harvard uh, Road for the most part, maybe a little bit on an angle. Uh, and so the contour in the northwestern corner is uh, 455. So it grades about five feet from going from the southwest to the northeast. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I just so want to see this. According to the, so oh, actually the, the topography lines are on here. So these, these lines are contour lines with the dashes mm -hmm. and the water basically drains perpendicular to those lines. So. Uh, the water, for the most part, is draining from the back to the front. We did perform an infiltration test mm -hmm. in the front of the lot, and so that's where we proposed to put an underground stormwater management system to uh, control on, the stormwater and meet this the is my side. 
And we did the, we did the And this is, wait. I'll tell you right now, this is, Barb, this is the spot Barbara, in the park out. Um, it's real hard for Arlene to, to take down a conversational exchange. So we'll let Chris finish, and then if you have a question, you route it through the board to, to Chris is how we do it. But go ahead. So what, what's the water, what in the front, you said there's a water mitigation detention underground? Right, there'll Talk be- Talk more about that. There'll be an underground stormwater management system that will uh, meet the code requirements for, vo for both rate and volume control. And Mr. Yoon, will the uh, loop tops all be pumped pipe to that facility? Yes. Loop top drains? Yeah, and there may, depending on the calculations, there may also be a, a yard drain collecting some of the, the runoff from the yard. Do you know how much water is directed from offsite through this property? This property being developed. At, at this time, we didn't go through those calculations. However, when when we do go through the calculations, we will consider any offsite water that's that's draining into the system. Yeah, it's just suspicious because I see the retaining wall on the neighboring property. I don't know what what that was before. So, okay, thank you. Um, just uh, sort of to maybe add, or get into some questions about uh, suitability for the neighborhood that. Uh, for the benefit of your neighbor. Um, the front edge of this house uh, would be within the median requirements for homes within 300 feet? Is yes, that... we'll have to meet that conformity of setbacks. Um, <coughs> and um, do you have, I, I know these are not, the neighboring houses are not depicted to scale on A1, but um, in your sense, uh, from a square footage uh, area, you know, um, on the ground floor or by height, do you anticipate this house to be uh, different or larger by some specific amount? Uh, could you quantify that in any way? So I don't, I don't believe these houses are, are exactly right, but I think they're close. And so I'd say that I think the, the new home is similar in width, but probably a little bit longer than the existing. And longer, would you say, is that like uh, twice as much or 50% as much or more than that or less than that? I'd rather not give you a number because I don't have the right. exact measurement. If you I don't know, that's that, okay. I'm just yeah. wondering, uh, since you depicted them, maybe you had a general I, sense. I'd say based on the way it's depicted, uh, it's probably almost twice as long shown this way. And just to confirm that all of the area and bulk requirements for a house in this district, in this, um, you will be complying with. That's correct. And that includes height, side yard setback, rear yard <coughs> setback, front yard setback, right? Correct, right. We will have to submit uh, to the grading permit and that'll go through the zoning review. And if, if anything is identified at that time, we'll, we'll correct it. So, so this lot is 5,750 square feet, right? Yes. If, if this lot were 250 feet larger, would you have to be in front of this board at all? No. Kenny, do you have any other questions? You wouldn't have to be here, but in the process of building this, you'd still have to address those the concern about the water runoff. That's so, knowing that she's your neighbor, can you satisfy her that you won't be intruding on her property with water runoff? That's correct. If, uh, if the lot was larger, we would still have to prepare the grading permit and provide the stormwater management. <coughs> Arguably, if it was a little larger, we'd be permitted a larger building and, and more impervious, and so maybe we'd have to do a little more stormwater. But, um, we would still have to do that, and I think to help address the neighbor's concern that we will be, we did do the infiltration test. We know that uh, the site does infiltrate, uh, which is good. Um, and so we will meet the code, and the system is composed in the front of the lot, so any overflow will be directed towards the street as opposed to any neighbor's properties. Because I would suggest to you that if, if this application is approved, uh, I'm certain there would be a condition that water runoff not adversely impact the neighbors. So 
if that were to occur, it would be a situation that um, you or Vince would have to address. Okay. Even post construction. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Mr. Young, just for my edification on the issue of the infiltration basin, when you do infiltration testing, is there any way to ascertain whether or not you're getting good infiltration rates because the neighbor's sump pump is working? <laughs> Uh, so, I guess that would depend on how often the neighbor sump pump ran. Mm -hmm. it, uh, when you do, as you know, when you do an infiltration test, um, part of the test is to evaluate the soils. And so, if the soils were such that there was, they were waterlogged often, then you should see some modeling or redox features that would indicate that. And so, if your neighbor sump pump was on draining out the water for that small time period, then uh, you would still see those features in the soil and know that uh, it, it's not good soil, not a good place to, to infiltrate. Um, now, if your neighbor had a sump pump that was running all the time for the last 50 years, then maybe you wouldn't, you wouldn't see those features. Mm -hmm. and, the, and you had no way of knowing the, your depth of yours. Is it below the basement level of the neighboring property? Or, or is there a distance separation that's required that you will have to meet um, between your... Uh, structures I don't I, I believe we did the infiltration tests at uh, six seven and eight feet deep if I remember correctly uh, so I don't know whether that will be below their basement elevation or not um, but uh, w as I said we we are the proposal is to put it under the driveway and keep it uh, kind of as you know, on the lowest spot of the lot and, and near the right of way as we can. Okay, I missed that. You're going to have it on, on the under the driveway. Oh, okay, I missed that. So it'll make even further from uh, the property line. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Anything else? No. Anything you'd like to add? No, thank you. All right. Kenny, everyone's done. And with that, I think I already asked this, but is there anyone else, resident of Hopford Township, that would specify in this case? No? Vince, anything you want to add? No, thank you. No? Okay. With that, we'll close the record on this case, and the decision will be rendered at our next regularly scheduled meeting on February 20th. Chris, that, that's the original exhibit, so that's got to make its way back up here, and we'll take a two-minute recess. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> How you doing, Jamie? set up
Tomahawk McGargy. We're going to start. I guess the red light comes on. All right, our next case is Z20-2, Francesca Santa Cruz, equitable owner of 145 North Eagle Road, DC folio number 2201-0032000, who seeks a variance from section 182-206B to use the first floor of the existing building as a therapist office. Applicant proposes to use the second floor as a dwelling unit. If and to the extent required, applicant seeks a variance from the parking requirements of section 182707B. Applicant also seeks any other relief necessary for the proposed use. Property is on R4 and located in the first court. Hi, Jamie. Good evening. Jamie Jen here on behalf of the applicant. Um, as just stated, we are seeking a use variance to use the first floor of 145 North Eagle Road as a therapist office which provides mental health and substance use, substance abuse treatment services, and we are proposing to continue the residential use of the second floor. I've handed out an exhibit package, and I'll just go through the exhibits um, briefly. Exhibit A1 is an area of the property. Uh, 145 North Eagle Road is shown sort of in the center of that exhibit. Um, immediately to the left um, is a church, and then there are some houses to the right, um, and they contain mixed-use commercial as well as residential. Exhibit A2 is a zoning map of Haverford Township. Um, there are addresses noted on certain of the properties, and those indicate um, neighbors who have signed a petition in support of the application. And as you can see, this is zoned um, R4. There is an office district immediately adjacent, as well as an R5 district and a CFA. There are, I believe, also um, some commercial uses in that R5 district across the street from Eagle. Jamie, just for clarification, the yes. subject property has an asterisk on it? Correct. Thank you. Exhibit A3 is an agreement of sale which shows applicant standing. Exhibit A4 is the 1973 decision which um, originally permitted a use variance for the property for the property to be used as a dental office. Exhibit A5 just shows the parking um, that's provided on the site. The parking spaces that are marked one through nine, there are actual concrete wheel stops for each of those parking spaces that have existed and then um, there is a bit of a driveway. There is no curb cut onto the street, but there is a driveway that uh, is on the side of the existing home that can also accommodate um, cars for the residential parking. Exhibit A6 are some photos of the property. Uh, the first sheet on top is the front of the property. You can see the shared driveway to the right. The church parking lot is to the left. The second photo on page one is the rear of the property, um, and you can also see some of the paving that's for the rear parking area. Page two, the top photo, that shows the entire rear um, where the nine cars can be accommodated, or the 10 cars could be accommodated. And then uh, the second photo of page two shows the side of the house where additional cars could also be accommodated. The next two pages sh just show the uh, dental chairs that's inside the, the building, as well as a small waiting area. Exhibit A7 is the petition that was signed by neighbors. Again, these are the neighbors that signed as shown on Exhibit A2. And then Exhibit A8 is the applicant's uh, CV. If the board doesn't have any questions about the exhibits, I can call my first witness. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll ask the questions <clears throat> as they arise. But I don't think there's any questions about okay. <clears throat> you being able to admit them. So go ahead. 
Uh, my first witness is uh, Guy Bottomley. He is the legal owner of the property. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be got? I do. And your full name and address for the record, please? Guy Bottomley, 531 Kathmere Road, Havertown, PA, 19083. Sure. B O T T O M L E Y. Okay. Go ahead, Jamie. What is your interest in the property? Um, I'm the owner of the property. I inherited it from my uh, father's. Uh, estate back in 2012. Are you familiar with the property and the surrounding community? Yes, I am. Uh, I've been, obviously visited the practice since 1973. I was two years old at the time. I uh, went every year for routine uh, cleanings, visits, and uh, obviously to get my teeth fixed. Can you describe the existing improvements on the property? Sure. So it was a former house since 1973. The first floor has acted as a dental office. Um, the second floor is a one-bedroom apartment. Uh, my grandmother lived there from the 80s up until the mid-90s. Uh, and in the back, there's a large parking lot. The size of the apartment is approximately 700 square feet, correct? That is correct. And has the property pretty much remained the same since your dad first occupied it? It has, other than obviously routine maintenance. And can you describe the practice that your father had at the property? Sure. Uh, at the height of the practice, he had uh, himself and another <coughs> dentist working there, one hygienist and an administrative person, and usually practiced six days a week, Monday through Friday, nine through nine, and limited hours on Saturdays. And when did your father stop practicing at the property? Uh, he sold the practice to an associate in 2008, but continued to practice up until 2010 as an associate to the new owner. And is that associate still practicing at the property? She is, but the practice is certainly winding down. And can you describe? Is winding down. Can you describe the neighborhood generally? Yes, it is uh, mostly a mixed use um, from Lincoln down to Sunny Hill on our side of the road. Um, there's a church to the right hand side, there's a locksmith to the left. And then there's uh, pretty much mixed commercial use with the exception of, I believe it's 137 North Eagle Road, uh, which is exclusively residential at this time. And what would be the unnecessary hardship if the property had to be used for residential use only? Sure, well, so it's been a dentist office since 1973. Um, it would take uh, extensive renovations to bring that back to a single residential use. Um, there's, an ex there's a large uh, parking lot in the back. Um, so it would be difficult, obviously, to bring that back to a residential single-family home. Will use of the property for, for a therapist office alter the essential character of the neighborhood or district in which the property is located? No. Will use of the property for a therapist office substantially or permanently impair the appropriate use or development of adjacent property or be detrimental to the public welfare? No, you know, there's a church to the one side, there's a, a locksmith to the, to the other side, and again, it's, it's mixed use throughout the whole block. If the variance is granted, will it be the minimum variance that will afford relief and will represent the least modification possible of the regulations in issue? So, say that again, I'm sorry. If the variance is granted, will it be the minimum variance that will afford relief and will represent the least modification possible of the regulation in issue? Yes. And have you spoken to your neighbors about the proposed use? I have, and they have no objections at this time. And those are all of my questions. <clears throat> all right, which neighbors did you speak to? Uh, I spoke to Mike DePala, who is the locksmith to the one side. That, that's the only person I have spoken to, and his wife, Debbie. And then the applicant has spoken to the others who've signed the petition. Yeah. Jamie, give me the address again for the one property that's a residence. 137, I believe. Okay, and regardless of the, the number, the only purely single-family home 
on that stretch on Eagle did sign the petition, correct? Correct. Okay. okay. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Here. On um, Exhibit A4, which was a decision by this board, um, it says at the in the, the last page, the conclu conclusion that the second floor be used for storage only. And you have testified that somebody has been living there for how long? Yes, yeah, so um, I guess it was in the early 80s. My grandmother moved in upstairs. Um, and she lived there till approximately 94, 95. And then there's been two or three tenants there um, since that time. Okay. And, and do you know if there was any agreement that altered this? Or? I don't. Again, I inherited the property. I never had a conversation with that, uh, with my father regarding that. Um, I, you know, I, this, I hadn't really even read this until I decided to sell the property, so I was not aware. Uh, the current tenant that's there now has been there since 2012. He's been there for eight years. Okay. Go ahead. Do you had a rental license uh, in place for that apartment? No. Were you planning to get a rental license before you sell it? Uh, I should have. I didn't even think of it, to be honest with you. Mr. Chair, can we go off the record for a minute? Yes. Mr. Chair, uh, I had an off-the-record discussion with counsel, and I'm sure it will be addressed uh, during the uh, applicant's testimony, but my understanding is that the applicant intends to reside uh, in the apartment should this uh, application be granted. I then looked at the advertising and the notice, and with that understanding, I believe that notice is sufficient um, to continue to proceed with this application today. Okay. Other questions, Kenny? No. Bill? Um, yeah, the uh, the driveway, it's not the shared driveway, so the driveway on the other side of the house. Um, you said you would park cars in there potentially, but it's not striped. You don't have any concrete tire blocks there, right? Um, why would you plan to park cars in that? There's actually no curb cut, so it's not really a driveway. It doesn't go out onto the street. So it's a paved area that can be used for parking. It's nine and a half feet wide, and um, I think you can easily fit at least two cars there. Have you done a calculation on the parking requirements that would apply to a, uh, a owner-occupied professional service uh, ground floor uh, with a residential upstairs? I have, and we've actually gone with the more restrictive medical office parking calculation. I think for there's a general office calculation that will get us a lesser parking requirement. Um, but because the existing use is a dental office, um, the way that the parking calculation works out is that you are required to have four spaces per doctor, and then you're required to have one space for each two employee. So for the original dentist that was in there, there were two dentists and I believe one employee. Um, and that would have required a total of nine spaces. And then- That assumes no one's living upstairs. Correct. So the additional two would be an 11, right? If someone was living upstairs. So with the current or the proposed use, um, the applicant will go through and answer the question, but basically she's proposing two therapists an administrator and a, and a uh, director. And that also requires nine because it's four for each um, doctor and the one per two employee. So that gets us to nine and then the, the residential will get us to 11 for the two. So where would you 
find the other parking spot? So there's currently, as you can see, there's 10 parking spaces with wheel stops at the rear of the building. And then we're saying you can accommodate at least an additional two in that um, paved area next to the building. But that would get us but to how the- would they, how would, if, if they, they parked end to end? They could, but under the code, we're required at most for 11. So if you park the one car there, so it, would, it would be able to um, back out. And will the director and the office employee be working at the same time? Possibly, yes. But the code requires one parking space per two employees. What are the uh, expected hours of operation? I'll have the uh, applicant answer that. Right. Um, but just to um, expand on the parking calculations, the reason I had asked for the parking variance was because I had filed the application actually before we had gone out there and actually looked at all of the wheel stops in the parking area. And I did it just in case there might be some sort of nonconformity in terms of how they were configured. Um, but basically, that's the existing condition there now that's been used by the dental office. <clears throat> You said the applicant would reside upstairs? Initially, she would. She would like the option to rent it out at some point. And if done, you know, if that's done, then she would have to get all of the rental licenses um, that are required, and she's aware of that. But in the, in the beginning, she intends to reside there. And the requirements for owner-occupied, um, you know, spaces, there, are there requirements that we, you would need a variance for her to move out then? I am asking relief that the second floor can be used as a dwelling unit. It doesn't, I believe, um, get governed by who's actually living there, whether owner or tenant. It's just I'm asking for a dwelling unit for the second floor. Yeah, I don't have any more questions. Jessica? No questions. Ed? And no questions. Then okay. I'll call my next witness. Okay. Please raise your right hand. Please ready to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I'll be God. I do. And your full name and address for the record, please. Francesca Santa Croach, 480 Garrison Way, Goff Mills, Pennsylvania, 19428. What is your occupation? I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. And can you provide just a little bit of your background and um, professional experience? Um, I have my master's degree in clinical psychology and marriage and family therapy. 10 years clinical experience, five years in a director administrator role. And what use are you proposing for the property? Uh, would be a therapist office um, for Serenity Behavioral Health. Um, Serenity Behavioral Health, which is basically me. Um, I would be providing mental health and substance use outpatient therapy for teens and young adults um, with a primary focus on ages 14 to 17. And what are the common reasons for uh, treatment? Uh, anxiety, depression, uh, difficulties at school, vaping, alcohol, marijuana use, usually at the beginning stages, experimental, uh, family conflict, family therapy, et cetera. Can you describe the proposed practice? Uh, outpatient therapy services, and then ideally we would have two therapists, one director, one administrative slash reception staff. Um, but initially it would just be myself and one other therapist. And what would be your typical days and hours? Monday through Friday, 11 to 8. Um, although every, every session would be scheduled in advance, so I'm assuming um, some of the nights we would end up closing earlier. And you said for the, for the most part, um, patient visits will be pretty low after 5.30, correct? Yes. And uh, you've heard me present to the board that you intend to reside on the second floor. Is that correct? I do. And but you will still like the option of ha you know being able to rent it out at some point. At some point in the future, yes. And if you were to rent it out, then you would have to get all of the inspections and the licenses that are required for a rental unit, correct? Yes. And in your opinion, will use of the property for a therapist office alter the essential character of the neighborhood or district in which the property is located? No. Will use of the property for a therapist office substantially or permanently impair the appropriate use or development of adjacent property or be detrimental to the public welfare? No. If the variance is granted, will it be the minimum variance that will afford relief and will represent the least modification possible of the regulation and issue? 
yes, that basically continued use as a professional office. And you have spoken to the neighbors about the proposed use, correct? Yes. And uh, the neighbors that you've spoken to are indicated on Exhibit A2, correct? Yes. And have the, do, do they have any opposition? No, they were great once I explained what I was doing. Basically, when she asked me what type of treatment I would be providing, like what reasons they come in for service, I gave them the same explanation. I have no other questions. <clears throat> Francesca, tell yeah. us a little more about the type of uh, conditions that you intend to treat people for, uh, specifically drug and alcohol. So, I mean, my simplest explanation is your basic teen, young adult, family trouble. So kids who are getting, usually they kind of are coupled together. So a kid's struggling with anxiety and depression, they try and self-medicate by experimenting with marijuana or alcohol, they get in trouble at school or their parents are concerned, they'll come in. Vaping is a big one. Um, so in order to provide any kind of drug and alcohol therapy, I need to apply to the state for them to say, okay, yes, you can do this. Um, and vaping alone would fall under that as well. And where, where are most of your clients or patients? My goal will be to treat the Haverford community, Haverford Township, Havertown. And where did you say you live now? Right now, I'm in Goff Mills, technically Conchahawken, West Conchahawken. Do you own a house out there? <coughs> I'm staying with my parents so I can save for this one. Parents <laughs> <laughs> And this is all outpatient? You all, all outpatient, yes. Un under any circumstances ever, it would I always be outpatient? wouldn't even be able to get a license to do inpatient with that type of property, so yes. Penny? About group therapy. Yeah, so it'll be individual, group, family therapy. But small. And what, what, what size group? 30? I mean, my, what, I, what I have projected is five to 10 kids in a group at a time. Um, the most that it would ever exceed would be, I, my ratio that I have to stick by is 15 kids per one therapist in a group, but if I do that, I'd be able to buy a bigger building. <laughs> um, so. and, and how would these kids get to your location? So because I'm um, my primary focus, which I would love to just do, but I don't necessarily want to limit it, is 14 to 17, so a lot of them won't have a car or won't have a license, so they'll either be getting dropped off by their parents um, my past experience at a different practice, a lot of kids Ubered at different times straight from school. That's all I have. Bill? So if there's two therapists working, um, there would be, how, how long is an average session? Is it an hour? Group, an hour to two hours would be. Individual, an hour. So typically, as you're finishing up with one, someone else has come in for to get ready for your next hour or appointment. Um, and so between two therapists, there's probably at least four cars, one patient who you're seeing, and the next one who's queuing up. I like to, so the part of this job, it requires a lot of clinical documentation and note taking. So me as a personal therapist and the person who's coming on board, we like to take at least 15, 20 minutes to kind of Regroup, do our notes, move on to the next client. How many, uh, how often do you think the groups of, let's say, five to ten kids, uh, how frequently is that occurring? And you said that things slow down during, after 5.30. Can you explain that also? That's because I would do group 3.30 to 5.30, so they could come after school uh, three days a week. Um, thinking Monday, Wednesday, Friday, don't necessarily want to lock into that, but I like the sound of that. Um, and then for young adults, if we do a young adult group, that would be during the day from one to three. So after that would be a good time to do, say if we, I need to have a family session or if a kid wants to stay after group to do their individual session then. So there should only be one or two kids after that time. Oh, and Tuesday nights, I might do a parent support group, but within the same hours. 
And so 11 to 8 would be your target. I don't have any other questions. Okay. Well, you, you said 11 to 8 is a target. If 11 to 8 were a condition of approval, that. Fine with me, yeah. I don't have to be there till 8, great. <laughs> Jess? No questions. Ed? <clears throat> a few questions. It seems like a residential property is not the kind of a place that you'd want to have group sessions of 15 people coming in at, at one time. I, I don't know how you could, could manage that, uh, being Eagle Road is such a high traffic road and coming in and out of small shared driveway. So that, that's kind of a complication for the neighborhood. Um, there's no way that you would accept not having large groups like that? I mean, I could do less if necessary how i was just trying to say that the ratio clinically ethically should be 15 to 1 with a the therapist is kind of an industry standard so i was just giving you that um i prefer a small group anyway clinically um but i didn't want to limit myself either well i think that comes with the issue of whether or not it's an acceptable use with parking and stuff i don't know that the parking is there i have to look into that a little bit more on my own to find out how the parking is you said a conservative estimate when you have that many potential Uber cars coming in and everything else. That's, that's a more ten, intense use than a small house that I would think I could accept. Um, do you know if the therapist office is a lot? Uh, that's probably not a good question for you. One second. The, the question is next, I think next door, they run a nursery school and a Bible schools. And would your clients present any potential hazards for those children? No, and I actually spoke with the pastor over there who passed along all the information. I sent them to the elders, and he signed the petition as well. I'm actually excited because they're trying to get more youth in, in their church as well. So one of his concerns was if there were any violent clients, and actually one of my stipulations, if, if a client displays aggression or violence, they shouldn't be ad admitted to the outpatient program anyway. But I'm talking but from your standpoint as a therapist your knowledge of history of treating these type of patients would they present any type not I mean I've always worked with teens it's kind of in my niche I haven't had any <clears throat> luckily significant mm -hmm. issues um, one of the things as well as the nursery daycare is out by 12 I won't have any I know I, I'm saying 11 but that's coming in doing administrative the first group would be one the, the teenagers wouldn't be there till 3 30 anyway thank you no other questions Jess you said you had enough night I don't have any questions. Kenny, do you have any other questions? Nothing further. Okay. I don't have a question for you. It's got to be yes. Off the record. We're going to go off the record. And the red light comes on. <coughs> um, we had an uh, off the record discussion. Some questions were posed to me as a solicitor for the board. Um, I am going to do some research uh, leading up to the next hearing of February 20, 2020, um, with the anticipation that I will be able to provide uh, the answers to those questions. And I, I believe the board is also going to uh, do their very best to render a decision on that uh, evening as well. Uh, would We would like the applicant to come back in case there are any questions that my research uh, brings up and with that what I would suggest to chair is that uh, just in the event that there's anybody here that wanted to testify today that can't testify on the 20th we take that testimony as well at this point that's what we're gonna do I don't have anybody else to call as a witness and Francesca will be back on the 20th great okay well let, let's see if there are any other questions for Francesca before we any no Bill I don't have any other questions. Francesca, do you do any court-appointed work? No. And do you intend to see any child predators or registered sex offenders? No, absolutely not. I, I can't. I only ask because there's a school next door. Yes. Ed? Uh, no other questions. Jessica? No questions. Okay. We may have a few more questions for you on the 20th. We wouldn't have done a decision tonight anyway. So yeah, uh, we'll close the record that night and we'll do a decision tonight. Okay. 
right. Jamie, you have no other witnesses, right? I do not. Okay. <clears throat> Should we ask if anybody from the public is here? Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you, guys. You guys can sit back there. With that, I'll ask if there's anyone present that received certified mail that wishes to testify. Anyone present that received regular mail? Any other residents of Ireford Township? So no one here that wants to address the board? Mr. D'Amelio? Please raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but truth, so I help you, God. I do. Thank you. You state you. your name and Steve D'Amelio, two hundred Walnut Hill Lane, Havertown, PA. Just a couple of questions. I, I, I share the same concern that you did, Mr. McGar, McGar yeah, McGargy. So long I've been here uh, <laughs> regarding the number of of uh, patients during a. Um, a group therapy because of the traffic situation there. Um, second of all, I'd like to ask if any drugs will be administered to the, um, I guess, their patients, you know, drugs like uh, Suboxone and things like that. Um, will that be administered? Okay. And we'll ask Francesca to answer, ask, answer the questions right. that you have once you right. list them for. And will they be treating... Not only, I guess, marijuana uh, drinking, but we're talking opioids as well. And the, clarify for me whether or not, um, so I, I believe that um, the client, I mean, the applicant is not going to see anyone who has committed a crime or is court ordered. It was no, right? Not, not court ordered uh, therapy. No. No. Okay. Oh, and the other question is, uh, they spoke to the neighbors. Um, it seems to me when I looked at the petition that they were mostly the businesses on um, Eagle Road. There was, I think, one on Briarwood. Did they reach out to any, any other neighbors on Briarwood or the surrounding streets there? Okay. That's it. Thank you for allowing me. Wait, any questions for oh, Steve? Sorry. Kenny? You do? No, I just want to thank him for showing up and being concerned about his community. Thank you. Bill, Appreciate no it. questions. Jess? No questions. Ed? Uh, no questions. Thank you. Jamie, you want to ask Steve questions? Please. Thanks, Steve. Me again? Answer? Or? Yes. <laughs> um, can you remind Dr me? Any can drugs you? administered? Uh, no, I don't have a medical license to administer any kind of medication. And are you going to be treating opioid treatment? Um, not the plan, um, but to speak to that, anybody who is at actively using a substance or at severe risk for medical withdrawal can't be admitted to the program. Anybody, anyway. So if somebody's using an opioid, they'll be referred to a higher level of care at the first phone call. Um, somebody that may have used. In the past, that's been sober for some time. That's not any risk, possibly, but I don't foresee it happening. Okay. And did you talk to any neighbors that are not listed on the petition? Uh, no, I did adjacent and across the street. So I tried to get more people. I wasn't able to get a hold of them. But Briarwood, my two on Briarwood are residential, Joel's residential, and Lincoln's residential as well. Sorry, 137 is Joel, I believe. And Steve is the commissioner of the first ward. The property is located in the first ward. Okay. So that, that's why Steve attends every hearing relating to any first ward matter. Gotcha. Does that answer your question, Steve? Can I ask, You know, it's it's. I just want to make it um, make it clear that it's it's great that she's doing this because you know it's obviously needed in in, in the township and needed in the community. There's a lot of substance abuse. Um, I just want to 
talked to her about this group called HADA that's in, I mean, you could look them up. HADA. H-A-D-A. H-A-D-A, Halfway Alliance for Drug Awareness. So if you do get any calls like that, you can reach out to them. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the situation in every community now with opioid abuse as well, you know. So it's, uh, it is an important um, function that you're performing. I just wanted to say that. I mean, certainly has concerns about the traffic. Those are just basic concerns, you know, with the, um, with the, um, the group therapy and things like that. And, and the medication thing, only because, uh, you know, it is close to the school, but that was kind of answered anyway. So those are my concerns and then my comment, because it is needed. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Anything you want to add, Jamie? I just want to clarify a couple things. In terms of um, <clears throat> the parking, I know Francesca has talked about 1 to 15 ratio, but that's sort of the maximum, not what she's shooting for. I mean, she does want to have um, a large enough group that the, the patients are benefiting from the group therapy, but she's not looking to do the 1 to 15. I just wanted to emphasize that that was the sort of industry standard for the ratio. And then in terms of um, the traffic... Can I just ask yeah. on that? What, what yes. do you think would be the minimum? Uh, that, uh, Max. Well, the maximum number that you could... Um, we know maximum would be 15, but uh, to be effective, what's, the, what's really the minimum number that... Uh, in a group session. So, I got two answers for you. So, realistically, if I had two therapists, I'd like to do a six and six if I could, just so they have that community support if I needed to. Because I don't really like to do a group with a bunch of kids, but I, I don't. What is my answer? I don't actually know. Um, I'd like to be able to do at least 12, if possible. And at the same time, another therapist would be seeing a group. They'd be, so what my plan is to have a therapist doing a group and then another therapist available to if a kid in group wanted a little bit of extra support. If parents wanted, if the parents of one of the kids in group wanted to do a family session at that time, they could too. Or if I had, if I say I had eight kids there one day, both therapists could potentially do the group together. But I guess what, what, what Bill's thinking about is what's the maximum number of people that you might expect to have there at any given time? Patient. I mean, I was thinking the 15 to the 15 to one, but realistically, with the first year or two, I'm thinking five to ten clients there at one time for a group. But if it's, it ends up being a, a service, like I don't necessarily want to turn a kid away. If they, you know, if they're suffering from anxiety or depression, they can't get an appointment anywhere else. I didn't want to limit myself. That's why I kind of. When you say the maximum would be 15 to one, that's per therapist. So there could be a scenario where there are two 15-person groups happening. The, I, I wouldn't have that because I would want that one therapist to be available okay. to, to assist. So you, you're asking for a variance, right? Or a modification to a previously granted variance. It, it goes with the property. So we, we may believe that you're going to self-limit your group to six people per therapist or whatever the case may be. But if we don't put a restriction on it in, in an order, if the application wants to be approved, if you sold that building and another therapist moved in and we didn't put a restriction on it, they could have an unlimited number, which might change the impact on the community. Because if, if there were two 15-person groups, so there are 30 people there with two therapists and an administrator, I mean, the place would be packed, the traffic would be impacted, you know, it sort of changes the impact on the community. I think that's why everyone, with, without hurting you or, or hurting the people that you're treating, mm -hmm. uh, which is very important to all of us, um, just come up with some way to put a maximum number. Um, that's why you see in the, the old order there was a maximum number of dental chairs. Because on average, a dentist sees X number of people per hour. There's two chairs. We could sort of do the math and know what the impact on the community is going to be. And the upstairs was only storage, so it was less impactful on the community. Mm -hmm. So it, it's you know a change, and that's why we're asking these questions. And you, you can think about it. And I didn't we can, know it was transferable. That's yeah, good to know. it goes with the problem. <laughs> I thought it was just me. Okay. And, and well, I want you to understand why we're asking these such questions too. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. think about these things, and we can resume the conversation at the next the next hearing. 
because, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot and then you walk out and go, oh my God, I agreed to something, I can't do that. So. Can I you know, ask what you guys are thinking so I can. I, I don't have like a number <laughs> in my head. This, this came up spontaneously. I'm dying to know, can you tell? <laughs> well, I, I mean, part of it is trying to figure out uh, if, how you scheduling these and your parking also, right? right? So if you're scheduling these things back to back, then, you know, it becomes a little tighter. If you had two groups of 15 running back to back, you have 15 people coming and 15 people going in the driveway, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's just one therapy session. Mm -hmm. if, if you come back and say, look, in these scenarios, I'm gonna space them out a little bit, you know, and, but we still think about your parking, how much parking, you know, we can't have people queuing up out onto Eagle Road, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because they can't get in and out of, the, of a shared driveway. Uh, all, there's a lot of different ways. I don't think that we're uh, trying to think about what's appropriate for you from a clinical setting. Mm -hmm. I, it's just the practical impacts on the neighborhood. Right. And I think that that is the good part about the practice because Francesca will be able to modify the schedules as needed if there is an issue. Obviously, she wouldn't want issues for people who are trying to come and have therapy. Um, as a practical matter, the parking need would typically be three um, because of the two therapists and then the, the two employees are not necessarily full time. So that would give you um, seven parking spaces that can allow, that can alleviate some of that. But again, most of these, these people aren't staying. They're dropping the kids off, or it's the Uber that's going to drop off. Maybe, but family and other th sessions, you'll have people come in, drive in, and park. Correct. And, and those tend to be sort of outside of the peak, mm -hmm. which is also nice. Right. So when you come back, if you have further thought on that that help us think about that, that would be great. And just so you guys know, as far as group, they'll never be back to back. I mean, my therapist was pissed, would quit on me. So there's at minimum a half hour break in between a group, and there would only be. So, so clinically, I'm just curious. Yeah. What, what's the ideal group size? I mean, it de kind of depends on the clients that are coming to therapy at that time. So anywhere between six to 12, I'd like to have. So if I have four kids who are in there with major anxiety and don't want to share it all, I'd like to have a couple other kids in there as well, um, especially if I know that they don't even share in small group settings. That way the other kids could have somebody to talk to. So really, I, I don't have a straight answer. It kind of depends case by case. It makes sense. And what percentage is, is this really uh, either a family unit therapy session or an individual versus a group? So the majority of the sessions that are scheduled are, during the day are going to be individual. So the groups would be for high school. I was going to do 3.30 to 5, three days a week, and that's it per group. And then if I get requests for young adults, that would be 1 to 3 or 12 to 2, three days a week as well. well it sounds like your focus is going to be on kids or that's, young adults. Yeah, I'm not, I don't plan on doing any adults. Anybody over the eight? Well, I, that's not true. An adult is somebody who's over 18, but kind of capping at 26 is what I plan on advertising as well. Just to kind of keep the continuity of the, the group. Kids are my niche. Nobody wants to work with teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that's a way to. Uh, can you? Please raise your right hand. I need to swear you in. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. And your full name and address? Mike Delapola, 141 North Eagle Road. I shared a driveway with the property in question. As far as parking goes, um, my customers come down the driveway. I have parking, and we all the parking lots in the back joint together. I can say that a lot of my customers are coming, even though I have parking spots open they will park in the dentist office. So there's, just to let you know that, I mean, so we all share the parking lots right now, even with the church. Some people park over in the church and walk over. So be aware of my customers will still be coming down that driveway as well. Right, and we're sensitive to that, right? That's exactly what right. part That's of the, the issues whole, that we're talking about. Right. Here. All right. Yeah. Just want to get that. So, 
How many spots do you have? Huh? How many spots do you have? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. But really, when people come in to use your shop, because I've done it, mm -hmm. you come in, you come around the house, and you pull into the right. Right. And there's really, it feels like there's about three spots there. There is. The three, and then there's two in the back, one by the shed and where my truck is. Yeah. You, I have a sign up saying don't block driveway, because a lot of people come down and just stop right in the middle of the driveway. They don't want to park. You have your own separate driveway. Actually. No, I share the driveway with, with that. Where's the driveway? Right here. So, is, I hear what you're saying, Mike. So, what, what yeah. are you trying to convey to the board? Are you just that when you're, you're talking about all her cars coming in and parking in her lot, to take into account that I'm going to have cars coming down here too, and they park over there as well. I mean, I don't care if her customers park in my lot, as long as they don't block any cars, and it doesn't bother me as long as we can share back and forth, and it won't be an issue. Well, obviously, the board cannot opine. I understand that. Because I can talk to her about it's that. My, if it were my <laughs> property, you know, maybe we could work something out if yeah. spaces were available. But, you know, it, it would, would be Francesca's property. Yeah. That's a matter that you two would have to work out. That's all I had to say. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Excuse me, can I say something? Sure. I'm not a resident of Avertown. Am I allowed to speak? You. As Francesca's dad, yes, I, I, then, uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll say yeah, but you can't embarrass your daughter. I, I won't. I do that many Never times anyway. Hand. Hi, my name is Ray Santa Croach. Please I, raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you got? I do. And your full name and address with record? Raymond Santa Croach, 480 Garrison Way, Goth Mills, Pennsylvania. Um, what would you like to tell us, Ray? I'd just like to say, for the last 10 years, I am in awe. Francesca's dedication to help people with problems, and I just think she'll be a great asset to this community. So I would like to say. Any questions, Ray? Were you paid? I'm sorry? <laughs> Were you paid to say that? Well, I paid to say that. <laughs> I'm going to get, you know what, when I go home. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> She's a great girl. Yeah. Anything else, Jamie? Would you like to All right. Anyone else that wants to address the board before we adjourn? Any other questions? No. no. Any other business that we have to handle? No? All right. With that, we will continue this case to our next regularly scheduled meeting on February 20th and with the goal of closing the record that night and rendering a decision that same evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. With that, we are adjourned.